All right, welcome everybody. On behalf of the Peoria Area World Affairs Council, it is my distinguished pleasure to, or my distinct pleasure rather, to introduce a good friend who has spoken to us on a number of occasions about Afghanistan and some other places as well, I might add. Um, this evening, we are going to be recording. And so if you do not wish to uh, have yourself on film, <laughs> feel free to turn <laughs> off your camera. And I would ask everyone to make sure you mute yourself. Um, if you forget, I'll mute you. But uh, um, that keeps it, it um, just the person who's talking. Um, and we will have a few prepared comments. Um, Don's going to moderate the questions tonight. With that, let me officially start us here. Tonight, we have Ambassador Ronald Newman. He is formerly a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, and he served three times as ambassador to Algeria, Bahrain, and finally to Afghanistan from July 2005 to April 2007. Before Afghanistan, Mr. Newman, a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, served in Baghdad from February 2004 with the Coalition Provisional Authority and then as Embassy Baghdad's liaison with the Multinational Command, where he was deeply involved in coordinating the political part of military actions. As a veteran, I'm sure that was uh, something that you were skilled at as well. Prior to working in Iraq, he was ambassador to Manama, Bahrain, from 2001 to 2004, Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Near East Affairs, 1997 to 2000, and Ambassador to Algeria, 94 to 97. He was also Director of the Office of Northern Gulf Affairs from 91 to 94. Um, I think because we know you so well, I'm going to cut it short Absolutely. and uh, introduce our moderators tonight. You all know Don Sanford as well. He's a retired master social studies teacher from Eureka High School, former member of the World Affairs Councils of America, the National Organization Board, a previous president of the Peoria Area World Affairs Council Board, and currently board member and co-chair of the programming committee. Take us away, Ambassador Newman. Okay, well, Angela, it's, a, it's nice to be back with you yet again, virtually in Peoria, but this being my second virtual occasion, I can say one of these days, I'd really like to come back and see you in person, <laughs> uh, which would be a pleasure. And I certainly have friends there as well. So anyway, let me go ahead. What I want to try to do tonight, give you a little introduction. And, and you'll remember from previous talks, if you read, it, Afghanistan is never simple. If anybody tells you there's a clear bottom line and, you know, they can all sum it up in a few few words, I, my basic advice is you can ignore them from here on out. Uh, whatever their bottom line is, doesn't really matter. This, this is never simple. Uh, it, the, the people kind of stay, the, many of the people stay the same year after year, but the pieces all change. It's a little bit like a kaleidoscope. <laughs> uh, the pieces inside are all the same, but every time you touch the thing, you get a different picture. And that keeps Afghanistan reasonably confusing. But I'll try to simplify a few things. What I want to do, first of all, I want to talk just a little bit about the president's decision. I do not really want to relitigate it. It's done. I, I want to talk about the theory of the case. That is what, why he laid out the decision or how he laid out the decision he did and what the theory of the other case was, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, I want to talk then about what we see on the ground in terms of the security situation now, what we find going on with negotiations, uh, and then what might our role be. We've said we still want one. And to talk first, put that in context, to talk a little bit about our strategic interests and our value-driven interests that remain after an evacuation. And that should be enough to leave you thoroughly confounded and get us to questions. Um, and some of you may have seen an article I wrote with a number of my colleagues, former ambassadors, that also talked about what I thought we ought to be doing. Well, let me start with what you might say, what I might call a theory of the case. The president's decision and very basically, it was, we're there exclusively about counterterrorism. He said, essentially, nothing about any other interest 
sufficient to remain in Afghanistan, women, civil rights, and um, were there for counterterrorism. And he made the case that the threat of Al Qaeda has been greatly reduced, probably true, uh, that Al Qaeda has shown up in many other parts of the world and therefore we can't fight only in Afghanistan, uh, that we have other places we have to devote our interest to and that we need a rebalancing of our forces. And therefore, after 20 years, it was time for the last American troops to come out. Having said that, the president also said that we did have interests still, and we would remain engaged. We would continue to support the Afghan forces, military forces, but not with troops. Uh, and we would continue to support the Afghan state economically. The criticism, and it's, uh, there's been a lot of it, including in Congress, and it's a, it's a bi I would say this is a bipartisan case. There's bipartisan support for getting out, and there's bipartisan criticism. It's not, it was one of the few issues, I suppose, that we can be blessedly divided in a way that isn't on partisan lines. Um, so, you know, enjoy. Uh, the, the criticism has been that there is potential for Al Qaeda to enlarge its sphere, that it has Taliban has not broken relations with them. Islamic State now is there, uh, that there is a potential for terrorism to come back. And the president did, by the way, address counterterrorism as uh, something we were still going to have to worry about, but we would worry about it from outside of the country in terms of military. Uh, the criticism is that the state will fall apart. Uh, women will be lost, refugees will pour out. And one can argue almost endlessly about which of those futures will work itself out. And perhaps neither one of them is necessarily preordained, but is going to be driven a lot by what Afghans do for themselves. But that was the theory of the case. The decision is made, the people are coming out. Now, there's something that I think is important to understand about the way this decision was made. This decision to remove the troops was made with zero pre-planning. There are a lot of big questions that have to be resolved to carry out the policy which the president announced. He said, we will continue to provide assistance to the Afghan military. We have to figure out how we're gonna do that with no advisors in country and with no people, uh, no military personnel of our own in-country. He has said that we will continue to remain engaged diplomatically in Afghanistan. One of the big questions is, how is the embassy going to remain secured with no foreign troops? That's a question that every uh, allied embassy in Afghanistan is asking. One of the questions they're asking now, a subset of that is how is Kabul airport going to be secured so that if things go to hell, they are sure there's an airport under firm friendly control that they can get out with. We have said we will continue to support them economically, but there is no decision on what that means. The president announced that we were making 300 million available, but that was 300 million that was already there had been embargoed by Secretary, then Secretary Pompeo to put pressure on the Afghan government. And so we're now lifting the embargo and that's fine, it's a good thing, we should have done it. But to talk about it as though it were new money is to me kind of playing a shell game. Uh, this was there already. Now, before one criticizes the administration for not having answers to any of these questions and, and a long, list of other ones, including how are you going to supervise the money if you're going to put money into the Afghan forces and the civil civilian government? How are you going to know whether it's being stolen? And by the way, if it gets stolen, then there'll eventually be a scandal and then the money will be cut off. So you know, these things have real consequences. Well, the president, though, basically had, a, he came to a fork in the road. He had a binary decision. He could have a planning process to answer these kind of questions before he announced the decision. 
in which case the decision would leak because you can't mount a planning process of that size in Washington and not have it leak. Uh, my father years ago, some of you may have heard me say years ago, my father joked that the ship of state is the only vessel that leaks from the top. Uh, and uh, in this case, you would have had the top in the middle and it would have been a gusher. And you can understand why an administration did not want one of its major decisions of its first few months in office to leak. But if you don't want it to leak, then you can't plan. There is no way you can go in both directions simultaneously. So what we have now is a policy without a strategy. We have a policy that we will remain engaged. We will support the Afghan army. We will support the government. We will continue to pursue peace negotiations. Uh, and we will try seek to build a regional peace strategy. And those are all really good things. And now we just have to figure out how to do all of them. Uh, that's a little demanding. There, I've had various figures that there are 20 working groups or there are 40 working groups. I mean, they're, they're beavering away out there. This is, they're, they're silent in public. Uh, reminds me of something a former deputy secretary said once, that there are moments when on the surface, it's like a duck. It looks very serene on the surface and underneath those two little legs are just paddling like mad. Um, <laughs> and so there's a lot of that. The, the bureaucracy is paddling like mad to try to figure this out. It's not like nothing is happening, but it means that we are not yet able to give any expression to the policy. Uh, and I will come back to that because it's a, it's a very important point in terms of our credibility. I should mention in terms of our allies that there was a consultation process with NATO, something the Trump administration was not much given to. Uh, Secretary Blinken went to Europe, met with NATO other foreign ministers, Secretary Austin, met with the defense ministers. I would say that we spent a fair amount of time listening to our allies and then by and large ignored them because the predominant advice from the Europeans was to stay. Now, it, it's a very odd situation, you know, when the Germans and the Italians want to remain engaged militarily and the United States doesn't. Um, but that's where we were. So we, uh, we consulted, we heard our allies, and then we decided to do what we wanted to do. I think, but they have gone along and they have decided that they're keeping the pledge of NATO uh, in together, out together. Everybody's going to leave. Uh, by the way, one of the questions that has to be answered it involves contractors. There are a lot, you know, we only have about 2,500, 3,000 troops that were in Afghanistan when the president made the decision. There's something like 15,000 contractors, not all Americans, most of them American companies, but many of them third country nationals, South Asians, but there are many Americans there. And the contractors have been a critical piece of keeping the Afghan Air Force flying and keeping the helicopters flying and keeping the equipment maintained. And, you know, before one sneers too much at the Afghans for not being able to do all this themselves, you know, we didn't decide to really build this Air Force till 2010. So, you know, before one decides to sneer at them for not having developed the entire echelons of maintenance in 10 years for an Air Force, many of the airframes of which they didn't have then, uh, it, it's also important to remember that we use contractors a lot to maintain the American forces. I don't know how long our Air Force could fly with no contractor support. Uh, so one of the figures we have, to, one of the things we have to figure out among all the other long list of questions, is how contractor support is going to be maintained. Otherwise, the force is going to fall apart. So we got this long list. So where are we in security? Uh, not good. Very not good, actually. Uh, ever since we signed the withdrawal agreement with the Taliban in February of 2020, we have essentially stood on the defensive. 
And we, the Afghan military has largely stood on the defensive until quite recently. The Taliban has repeatedly gone on the offensive and probed. So what you have is a situation in the ground, on the ground over the last year in which the Taliban repeatedly attacked and pulled back if they got hit. And we and the Afghans stood on the defensive, but hit back, sometimes hit back quite hard when we were hit. But that means that the strategic initiative went completely into the hands of the Taliban. And that's not a good way to fight a war, and especially not an insurgent war. And so over the last year, the Taliban has expanded its rural control. And it probably now occupies what people argue 50%, 80% of the country, most of which is all of which is rural. They do not occupy anything like that percentage of the population because Afghanistan has become a pretty heavily urbanized country. So the Taliban has a, a, lot of, a lot of terrain. They don't necessarily have a lot of the population, but it is very clear that their control has been growing. They are closer to many cities. They have more checkpoints on major roads. It is more and more difficult to travel completely safely on any road in Afghanistan if you are a government employee. Um, a lot of areas where, you know, in my time we could drive, places I drove to, who wouldn't touch that now? Uh, so there is a deterioration in security. There has also been, um, well, on the one hand, I would say the Taliban did restrain themselves from the big bombs in cities that we'd had before. Recently, they've gone back to that a little bit. But what they started, and they've never taken credit for it, but I think it is clearly them. They've started an assassination campaign. And the assassination campaign has not been directed at senior officials. It's been directed at the educated middle class, at young women who work in television studios, even if they're not on the screen, at women judges, at journalists, male and female, at the head of the election, free election commission, uh, was not even a government official, um, lawyers, judges, activists for civil society, the, the sort of the people we like most, who have most bought into our values, are being assassinated every week in Kabul. And that's a pretty clear message from the Taliban that we don't plan to have you around uh, in our country if we get it. You could leave now or die. They don't say it, but I think every Afghan in that class understands that's the message. And there are people, I'm told, I talk to people in Kabul fairly regularly, uh, there are people who tell me that friends of theirs who they thought would never leave are now thinking about leaving. It's accelerated the brain drain. I think you're beginning to sense that this is not a good situation. Um, now, where are we on peace negotiations, which people desperately hope would pull a rabbit out of the hat and save the situation? Uh, let me back up for just a moment to remind you where we have come from. We signed an agreement with the Taliban February 2020. It was not a peace agreement. It was a withdrawal agreement to take US forces out of Afghanistan. We made very specific commitments about timeline. Taliban made vague, somewhat vague and general commitments about controlling extremism. They didn't actually say they would break with Al-Qaeda. They only said they would control Al extremism. Uh, and there was an agreement to begin negotiations, although the Taliban did not agree to begin negotiations with the Afghan government, which they don't recognize, but only to begin negotiations with a kind of composite group that includes the government and representatives of major political factions. 
And that group has been formed. And that may be a good thing, actually, because it means there's a broader political base of support uh, for the negotiations. The problem is there really aren't any negotiations. There are meetings. They have had meetings in Doha. Well, first of all, Taliban spent the first six months making additional demands for the release of prisoners, uh, particularly. And we elbowed the Ghani government, Ashraf Ghani, president of Afghanistan, we elbowed his government pretty hard to yield up these prisoners. We had said in a meeting in Kabul that we would make, we agreed with him to make best efforts at a mutual prisoner release. We went to Doha gutter and signed an agreement with the Taliban that had a hard and fast promise to release 5,000 prisoners, although the prisoners were in Afghan hands, not ours, and they hadn't agreed to the release. You may begin to detect why the Afghan government feels a little bitter about this from time to time. Um, but they've gone along. So Taliban spent six months on this. Meetings have then been held. There have been no, no substantive discussions. That is, they have never actually been able to discuss what changes would you like to see in the constitution? What would be the place of women? The Taliban make vague statements that, of course, women will be fine because they'll have their rights under the Sharia. There has been no discussion of what that means specifically. What, how, will, how will law, they say we want Sharia law, okay, fine. How is that to be reconciled with civil law? Uh, who's going to do what? How is the government going to be run? Nothing. None of that has ever, certainly hasn't been agreed, but more important, it hasn't been discussed. There, people talk about talking about it, but they haven't actually done it. Now, there are those who hope somehow a peace process will get moving. I would like to see the peace process get moving. Uh, my own judgment, and you please remember, I am totally out of government, have been for years. Uh, I see absolutely no reason to believe anything is going to happen quickly in the peace process. This is sheer fantasy. It's fantasy for several reasons. First and foremost, because it's pretty clear the Taliban believe that they're winning. They've just had a major victory over the United States. Now, President Biden <coughs> sort of couched this as we've done what we came to do, and maybe we did. But I can tell you that 9-11 now is Taliban Victory Day, and it's Al-Qaeda Victory Day in Afghanistan. It's not memori memorialized New York. It's Al-Qaeda Victory Day. Osama bin Laden, the late and unlamented Osama bin Laden, at one point wrote in some of the things that were found in his computer after we took him out, that uh, he hoped the United States would be drawn into war in Afghanistan because it would not have... Um, it would not have the stomach to remain, and in the end, it would be defeated. So if you set that writing up next to what we're doing, this is Al-Qaeda Victory Day. Now, I would say that negotiation, that agreement, although I didn't think much of it, I would also say Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad, who negotiated it, probably did the best he could because President Trump really, really wanted to leave and nearly didn't give a damn about much of anything else. And so he was constantly pushing to go faster, leave faster. And so you have these anomalies, for instance, that when the agreement was signed, then Secretary of State Pompeo and then Secretary of Defense Esper both said this agreement was conditions-based. That is that we, you know, we would take the first tranche of the troops out but after that, we had the right to slow down if the Taliban wasn't moving according to the agreement. But President Trump continued to pull troops out faster than the agreement with no conditions. So this has this left President Biden in a very weak position. I have to admit, he had to decide either 
he's going to keep troops and break the agreement and the Taliban's going back to war with us. And that was one of the reasons that he decided to pull out. Uh, or he's honoring the agreement. Well, he's almost honoring it because we're leaving by September. So we have a declining security situation up to now. And we have no realistic hope that we're going to have peace negotiations soon. Might have them eventually if the Taliban don't win. Now, there are some other things going on, though. One is the Taliban would rather take power by some negotiated agreement than having the country collapse. And they themselves know that even if they roll into Kabul, there are a lot of people that are still going to fight them. And you're very likely to have a civil war. And that could go on for a long time. The Taliban don't want that. And in fact, the Taliban wish to keep the United States involved. They don't want our forces. They really do want our money. They know that they're going to be presiding over a busted country and that we're the only ones with the resources to really help them. So as strange as it is, they've made very clear to us that they really want us to continue to be involved in Afghanistan economically. Uh, Afghanistan is a place where you could be killing each other on the one side, talking about how you want to work together on the other at the same time and meaning both of it. Uh, just a small illustration of the point I made at the beginning that this is not simple. Um, what I think you're going to see, and you know, it's always a little dangerous to predict anything that's close enough that people will remember what you said if it didn't, it doesn't happen. Uh, especially if I'm going to come back to Peoria. But uh, what I think you're going to see, say over the next six, eight months, before the end of the year, is a major Taliban push to take several different provincial cities. Uh, this is something they've tried to do before. They've always been turned back. <clears throat> and part of the reason they were turned back, though, involved our Air Force. So I think they're going to try it again. And basically, you got you, you may have some variation, but essentially, if the Afghan forces hold and the Taliban does not succeed in taking and holding cities, then I think you will have the potential of the war going on, the Afghan forces not losing. And you have the potential that at some point the Taliban will decide this really is a stalemate and they really do need to negotiate. The other possibility, though, is that the Afghans run. Taliban takes several cities and then it is quite possible that you will see the army fragment and come apart. And at that point, you could see things really come apart very quickly. Uh, and I, I can go into that scenario in more detail than nobody wants. But um, this means a lot of this is up to the Afghans. Uh, the army is big enough and well enough equipped that if their morale holds, they, there's no reason they should lose cities. Those are defensive battles. People have fought defensive battles for years or centuries. Even in the modern age, people have fought defensive battles very successfully when they did not have every bit of technology. It doesn't require the same kinds of skills it does to wage an offensive, especially against insurgency that's hard to find. They're going to come at you. So the, I think, you know, they may talk about equipment, ammunition and things. This is going to be about Afghan morale. So it's not like the end of Vietnam, by the way, in several ways. I mean, it could end like that. But just to compare, because that kind of comparison is in the air these days. At the end of the day in Vietnam, first of all, the Americans had cut off the ammunition. Now, we'd cut off the money. They couldn't buy ammunition. And they were running out of ammunition. We haven't done anything like that. Secondly, they were faced by an invasion that was a conventional invasion. In Vietnam, there were 20 North Vietnamese divisions coming south, including armored divisions and artillery. And this was not a, the popular guys rising up in the bushes and storming. This was an organized invasion from another country, the North Vietnam. That's not going to happen either. 
So this is going to be much, and by the way, there were Vietnamese units with some, I forget which division it was, just north of Saigon that held out for 12 days until they were finally overrun. So they didn't all fall apart. Some of them did. This is going to be about their morale. They're going to make it or they're not going to make it. Now, one of the things that's going to undercut that or may is the infighting of Kabul politicians. And they're, you know, there's a power game that goes on. That's not completely unknown to the United States. Um, we don't do real well on coalitions government right now. You've heard about bipartisan, but you probably haven't seen much of it lately. Um, so if you, you take that and put it into the middle of a war, uh, you know, you, you have a little understanding, but that is weakening their cohesion. And just to sum up, what is a big, you know, what do we care anymore? And I think you can divide our reasons for caring into, I mean, they overlap, but you can divide them into strategic reasons and what I would call value-based reasons. Strategically, Afghanistan has a potential to spread instability into Central Asia, into China, into Pakistan. All the regional countries worry about it. The trouble is they don't worry about it in the sense that they think there's something they can do about it. So a regional strategy is hugely needed, but it is extraordinarily difficult to put together because regional states don't really have a common regional view of their interests, and they tend to protect the people or help the people who will protect their borders and those people fight with each other. So there's a lot of chance, there's a strategic problem of regional stability. There's a, even a problem with Pakistan. It's got to, it faces fighting with people who are now going to find themselves, could find themselves as much more secure base in Afghanistan. Um, there is the problem of terrorism that Al Qaeda is still there. The Islamic State has been beaten up pretty badly, but it is still there. Uh, if you go into the civil war kind of scenario, the government falls apart, you go into a civil war scenario, then you will certainly have more space in which Al Qaeda can develop and in which the Islamic State can develop and those can become threats to us. And then you might ha you have what I think you could call value-based interests. Uh, you have certainly the business of the interpreters and people who've actually worked directly with us. There's something like 17,000 backed up now in the queue. <clears throat> but then you have a much larger group of people who have bought into our values. The whole educated generation that has come up over the last 20 years been educated both inside and outside the country and has gone big time for a free press and pushing for more just laws and for a just voting system, although they haven't really got it, but they've certainly got people who are trying to get it. Uh, so you have a whole lot of people, <coughs> excuse me, who have essentially bought in to what we spent 20 years funding and talking about which are the values of free press and democracy. Uh, I don't know what that's worth. You know, we've decided it's not worth Americans fighting for, uh, but maybe it's worth something. And so there are things we can do. And uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, there's an article that I, Angela has it and, and Don has it, uh, that, that I laid out a number of things, but it has to do with showing that we, that our words mean something because frankly, our words don't mean much by themselves at this point. And so there are things we can do. They might not be decisive. Everything we can do now will be uh, sort of adding to the potential willpower of the Afghans. But at the end of the day, if that willpower cracks, we're not gonna fix it. On that cheerful note, uh, but remembering that it is also not done. The Afghans themselves have a choice. They can fight. And in fact, in one sense, we've been here once before. After the Soviets left, the government of then communist president Najibullah made a lot of 
efforts to find a compromise solution. Whether he was sincere or not, but he made a lot of efforts. These were all rejected by the Mujahideen, which we were aiding, by the Pakistanis. The collective view of all of the Mujahideen, Afghan Mujahideen, was that government of Najibullah is going to be gone within weeks, if not months. And they launched a huge battle at the city of Jalalabad. Tanks, artillery went on for weeks. And they lost. Everybody knew the Najibullah government was coming down except Najibullah. And by the way, it didn't for about another three years until the Soviet Union completely fell apart and the money stopped. That doesn't mean it's going to happen like that this time. It's just good to remember that everybody can think they've got this figured out and it changes and they don't. So uh, there are still things we can do. I believe they are worth doing for the interests that are residual. We have huge number of big questions we have to get answered. And right now I don't know what the answers are. Uh, and the Afghans at the end of the day are either gonna find the courage and the will to stand up for themselves or they're gonna fail. And on that list of open-ended and at this moment unanswerable questions, I'm happy to try to take your questions. All right, uh, Ambassador Newman, thank you so much. Uh, that was an excellent uh, uh, really kind of recap of, uh, of many things going on and the issues uh, confronting Afghanistan and the United States with its policy right now. Um, I've got a few questions I'm going to ask you, and then I encourage everyone in the audience, you can uh, go to the chat and type in your questions there. And uh, hopefully I will catch most of them. Angela's my backup, uh, that if somehow my eyes fail me, uh, that she makes uh, sure that if we have an important question that, that uh, definitely hits on a topic that uh, we haven't covered, uh, we wanna make sure we get that in there. So you can be typing your, your questions in. Um, you've, um, and by the way, the article, we'll try to make sure that we do get that to, to everybody uh, that's on this uh, Zoom call and also uh, uh, to our membership. Excellent, it was, I've told you this uh, earlier, yeah, excellent article. Um, it, it really, I think, gave a very thoughtful uh, concept and idea of how to address some of the issues facing. One, you, you've, in your opening remarks have hit it, but one thing that caused me to want to invite you is I respect your opinion highly and, and your service to this country. Jessica Donati wrote of um, Wall Street Journal wrote a book called Eagle Down, and she was embedded with, uh, uh, well, U.S. Special Forces, the Green Berets, wouldn't let her embed, um, I think maybe once, but she would embed with uh, U.S. Afghan special forces who were right there beside uh, the camps with the U.S. special forces. Uh, so she got a firsthand experience of seeing what it was like on the actual battlefield. What I came away with is from her book, and one of the characters, by the way, in the book is a major who's from Peoria, Illinois. So we have another connection there. Um, the struggle for those forces was that they only could hold out and fight with close in air support. Because uh, as you pointed out, the Taliban, very aggressive offense, um, but the, it's, and in, you know, in Vietnam, many of our battles, the key to our winning for the US ground forces is, is that, that great air support that we get from our talented pilots. In, in my mind, as good as the Afghan uh, special forces in particular are commandos. Uh, I'm just not sure after reading that book with, without that kind of true air support that they can be successful no, no matter how they fight. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, thanks, Don. I have read the book. Uh, I, th I think I've read the same book. Uh, it goes particularly into the battle for Kunduz, as I... Yes, that's remember. right. Um, there are a couple of things that have happened since that book. One is, if the next phase plays out the way I think it's going to play out, then a lot of the fighting is actually going to have the Afghan forces on the defensive. That's a different proposition from having to go in and try to retake the town. 
That's true. Uh, and, and it, you know, that's why I said so much depends on morale. Because, you know, you can f fight with very little training and put up one hell of a defense if you're determined to do it. Look at the Soviets and Stalingrad. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to have the morale. If you don't have that, then that that goes away, you know, that people break. And that's what happened in Kunduz. And that's part of what she documents is how the other Afghan forces came apart. Um, so for that near phase, not for retaking the country, I think that's a different situation. Okay. Now, the second thing is the Afghans do now have a limited air capacity of their own. It is not enough, and it certainly won't be enough if they have to fight multiple places at one time. But they have uh, a certain number of airframes, uh, ground attack aircraft. They do have uh, helicopters. Again, not a lot. They are becoming more proficient. For years, I would go out and I would ask people uh, about the Air Force in particular, and I would ask about whether they could fly a close support mission, or whether they could talk to their ground forces and you know, those of you who've been in the military know that that is a very complex operation in order to hit the enemy and not bomb your friends. Uh, and uh, what, I'm, what I'm hearing now, and I'm not on the ground, I have been back a lot of times, but not the last two years for various reasons. Uh, but what I'm hearing now is that they are developing, that they have that capability. Right. It's probably not as precise as ours. Uh, but it's there, it's pretty good. So they will get some support, but nothing like ours. Um, and then of course, there's always a possibility that we fly something at the last minute. The most important thing, frankly, is that we don't fly and they don't lose because then it really is Afghan. I don't know if that's possible. Uh, and that, you know, that book makes you wonder. Uh, I, I so that's all I can say is, I don't think it's impossible, good. but uh, at the same time, the, the really good force, the commandos, is not big enough to be everywhere. Well, and that's this is going to lead into my next concern from all the articles I've been reading. Uh, one of them addressed the idea that in reality, President Ghani is actually the mayor of Kabul. Uh, and that you still have all of the warlords, all of these other groups uh, that the United States never quite understood that, you know, it wasn't a really a centralized government. Uh, people are trying to figure out their own places to control their own areas. Uh, so my question now is, how optimistic are you that the, the, the warlords, the tribes aren't going to just go ahead. I mean, I know, like you said, the corruption, the kind of the internal politics is part of that battle uh, in the central government. Um, and if, if they do, then does that mean the military really kind of figures out who they need to go support, who's going to be the stronger, the better winner? And now you've got almost before we went in, it's all the pockets of the different warlords fighting both the Taliban and among themselves. Um. <laughs> That is certainly a possibility. You do have a number of areas where what I hear, remember, I'm not there and I don't, you know, I don't see the intelligence channel stuff, although I'm not sure how good that is anyway right now. But uh, what I what I think I know and, and hear from a lot of Afghans is that there was a lot of rearming, um, re particularly in the Hazaras who are sort of, they were particularly picked, they're Shia, particularly picked on by the Taliban as well as the uh, Islamic State and Tajiks and others who do not want to live under the Taliban. They're not convinced the army will hold uh, and they're prepared to fight. But they are not yet out in arms taking, this is sort of, they're there, they're in the background. Okay. If the army holds, I mean, they also wield a lot of political power in various areas. They, they will continue to have power. They will continue in some ways to um, be a, a force that, that uh, I don't want to say balance is not the right word. They'll be a counter force that keeps, helps keep the government from being as efficient as it could be. 
Uh, but there are an awful lot of interlocking networks of influence, money, one thing and another. I mean, they've been a problem all along in a way because they've never gone away. Uh, but I don't see them rising up and throwing off the government. I think that's a second phase that would come if the government and the army melt down. The, the bigger question at the moment is whether the leaders of these groups at, who have become political leaders will find enough way to stand together. Now, there's a lot of talk among them. Uh, the question, part of the question is they can stand together for short periods of time. They'd also, each one would really like more power, uh, which is what led me and my colleagues, the other ambassadors who co-authored that article to recommend that right now for all the problems, we need to put solid backing behind Ghani because uh, there's a lot of problems with Ghani and it's hard to deal with him sometimes. I mean, he's a micromanager, he has a furious temper. Um, but right now, I think we have a binary choice. You see, if we stand behind Ghani, I do not think any of the other factional political leaders will totally break because nobody wants to go it alone without the United States. Now that that lasts forever. Uh, you know, we've been bedeviled for 20 years by people exaggerating how much of a plan we had for Afghanistan and how much control we had. It's, you know, my argument is, well, right now for a few months, maybe you get something positive out of that because if you back him solidly, it'll tend to pull people together around him. If we don't send a clear message, they are likely to continue fussing with each other. And that's going to be very destructive. They're not the only ones in the world. I often think of if in Afghanistan, I often think of a story I heard years ago about Lebanon. Lebanese politicians, you know, are, are pretty much like this. And the story was, why don't you need, the question was, why don't you need a lid on a pail of Lebanese crabs? And the answer was because as soon as one tries to get out, the others pull him back. Uh, and, and that's a, a pretty good lay motif for a lot of Afghan politics as well. Uh, so it is a danger. First phase, will they hold together enough to give a sense of clear direction to the army, which I think will be important to morale. If the army breaks down, then you have a real possibility that you go back into a full-scale civil war exactly with the tribes, the people you're talking about. Oh, okay. Um, I know you've answered a couple of the questions. I had one more, and, and it's uh, also in the uh, the chat questions. But I'll tell you what, it would probably take a separate program for this. But it's the idea with Pakistan. With we we know that they are they they've always been giving them supplies um, and refuge uh, on there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I I don't see that ever stopping. I don't know how how big a role do you think Pakistan's going to play with the Taliban? Pakistan unquestionably can be a spoiler. It is not a hundred percent. They've always been a little bit opaque in what they want, and probably because there's not full agreement within Pakistan. Part of what drives Pakistan, and I remember years ago, this was their then chief of staff, which was two or three chiefs of staff ago, saying to General Allen, who was then commander, that I expect you, the United States, will not stick this, that you will leave and you will leave a mess and we're going to have to clean it up. Uh, they have never believed that we would see this through to an end. And so in addition to their other troublesome issues, they see part of their national interest, if you will, as being to maintain the support, or at least enough support that if the Taliban come to power, they're going to be able to work with them. On the other hand, it's not clear that they really think the Taliban, the Taliban are not their agents. They get a lot of support from the Pakistanis for a whole lot of reasons. Uh -huh. But they may be just as difficult for Pakistan as the other Afghan governments have been uh, if they take power. This is not a, if there's anything you can clearly say about Taliban, this is not a tame group. 
uh, and the Taliban really don't like the degree of control the Pakistanis exercise because all the Taliban leaders' families live in Pakistan. And the Taliban are very aware of that. And, you know, people who've met with them have heard this, that they don't like the heavy hand of the Pakistanis. Pakistanis have been helpful in bringing the Taliban to the negotiating table. They have not been helpful. They've not done anything that one can see to get them from the negotiating table, from sitting at the negotiating table to agreeing it to something. Um, I think right now they're gonna kind of stand back. They're not gonna put a restraint on the Taliban. I, I don't see any sign that they're gonna really restrain them. Um, at the same time, I don't know that they're really jumping up and down with joy, wanting them to win right now. I, I wish I had a clear answer for you. No. If part that, of the, that's as clear as I heard. Quite yeah, I think yeah, everybody's yeah. in the same boat on that. The, the part of the question that can you get the Pakistanis to really bear down on the Taliban? My best guess is no. Uh, will they actually sort of up their support to try to go for broke? Probably not. And so you're going to deal with this messy, murky thing in the middle. I'm about right. clear as mud, but you know, all I can do is shave the, <laughs> shave the ends off the problem a little bit to get down to the part I don't really have, that none of us have ever been able to answer 100%. I, I think from day one, yeah, that Afghanistan's been a tough one to, to answer. I know Angela said that she had a question that was typed in uh, to her uh, before the program uh, started. And it was, um, I think I remember this right, uh, something to the effect that why didn't we simply uh, pull out of uh, uh, Afghanistan um, after, uh, I believe it was probably either we killed bin Laden or let's just say even after we ran him out of Afghanistan. Why didn't the United States just say, declare victory and pull out? Basically, because the United States has never wanted to leave chaos behind. Uh, and as the war got worse, we didn't really want to leave a Taliban victory behind. And this has always been a problem for us from the beginning. Because even at the beginning, invaded and really wanted a light presence. Rumsfeld was very big on this, light presence, get out quickly. But to get out, you had to have some kind of political structure. Otherwise, you're just leaving it to go to civil war, which was a little too much even for them. Uh, and to have a political structure, they end up with a government. You know, Obama had the same problem. He wanted to get the goals back limited because they'd grown under Bush from starting with this idea of a light footprint and very limited counterterrorism only. And they, they grew under the Bush administration. In the search for stability, we kept adding stuff and adding ideas. And so it looked like we were doing democratization. So Obama then realized correctly that we got a little out of hand and he wanted to rein it back in. So we said, the goal is now destroy Al Qaeda. That's it. That's the only goal, except you're dealing with a non-state actor that has regenerative power. It isn't like a state where you can get a clean surrender. You know, short of genocide, you don't get an, a total end. So if you want to really take them out and keep them out, then you need an army. And if you want an army, you probably, you know, armies don't exist um, alone. They, they represent a state. Their culture comes out of the state. So if you're going to have an army, you're probably going to have to have a state, uh, which you had actually. But if you're going to have a state that governs the army, then damn, you're going to have to have an economy. And then you're, then you're into a major aid program. So in fact, what you had in the Obama administration was a declarative policy that we're not doing nation building while we tried to build the army up threefold and build the economy and build the, all the civilian structures of government while denying we're doing state building. And could you please do it all in four years and get out? Um, and, you know, not surprisingly, given my way of describing that didn't work. Uh, 
is so you know each time the problem has been if you want to leave because you've got one goal established are you content with what you're going to leave behind um and if in this leaving now the state falls apart if you go back you know, there were five million refugees when we went in in 2001 and about i think somewhere around three million i could be off have gone back um, you know if a few years from now you have five million refugees and you have women being executed in the soccer stadium or even if you don't you have almost no education um then we'll probably have a certain amount of number of people saying well you shouldn't have done that and that but that's always been that you know there's never been a good time when you could take your hands off this bike take the training wheels off take your hands off the bike and be modestly confident the kid's not going to crash uh and by the way kill himself when he does and so that's you know if you put yourself in the mind of a parent trying to teach somebody to ride a bicycle and not wanting your kid to cry yeah that's kind of where you are and that's been why we haven't at any point up to now just left and it's why now the decision to leave is so fraught um i've got three different questions from barb larry and, and wes i'm going to kind of try to tie them together for time's sake um they're they're pretty much addressing uh who, how do you clear winning and losing? Uh, uh, you know, one was saying, you know, well, wh how would you define a, a U.S. victory? Other uh, two other questions are, um, how would you define, or what would happen if the Taliban failed? And as you said, maybe the Taliban reach a point that, well, we're we're just taking too many losses that the Afghan military is really holding. The government is staying stable enough um, that they would, would, would stop. I, I guess all these questions are asking, we're going back again, when, when can any of the sides declare a victory? And I, I'm assuming the United States has already declared the victory, and of course the Taliban have declared victory. <laughs> Uh, this is fascinating, but you you are you are getting into the the next seminar, not the next lecture here. Uh, <laughs> but, um, let me try to break it apart a little bit, and and then I, I know we're going to be pushing people on timing. One is well, first of all, yes, you could have a victory. The Taliban can win. I don't know that they will. But for those who say there is no military solution, of course there is. You can lose. Um, and it is possible that they will win. Might take another 10 years. But if the army falls apart, they're good for a long go. So they may win. Uh, if things don't fall apart and they continue to fight, then the situation will be that there's no longer a foreign army. They're excuse for jihad is weakened and it may well be that they come eventually to be, get serious about negotiations i don't know if that'll happen I, I do believe that that will only happen when they believe that there's a stalemate not when they see victory around the corner and then this last question how do you define victory and I think this is really a good, this is really a good question, but I think this is much larger than Afghanistan. Americans have got a kind of World War II image of victory in their head. Surrender on the decks of the Missouri, or you know, sort of total mm -hmm. collapse of Afghanistan. That works when you fight states. It cannot work when you fight non-state actors that have a capacity to regenerate. It is not possible to have that kind of condition of victory, whether it's Afghanistan or North Africa or anywhere else in the world. So if your only standard of victory is going to be that kind of total victory of the past, then you've predefined a situation in which America is guaranteed to fail in every confrontation with the terrorist movement over time. Yeah. 
I don't believe we are guaranteed to fail. But I think what you what it drives you to is you have to have a definition that you can live with of what is sufficiency, what meets your strategic interests. But it isn't victory in that total sense. In Afghanistan, I would say that if you have a state and an army capable of carrying on the fight for a very long time, albeit with our financial support, that that meets our strategic need to deal with the terrorist threat. Then it leaves a platform from which we can operate if we have to, to deal with something ourselves. That's messy, could go on for years, will make people profoundly unhappy. But I would argue that it meets our minimum strategic goals. And I think we will find other situations in the world like that, where yes, you are going to be mowing the grass, um, uh, you know, a bit, but maybe you can't replant it all. So that's what you're stuck with. And it, that's a discussion we really haven't had because people want to talk about victory. Uh, and because we're locked into a concept of victory that anything else is failure. And the trouble is the concept doesn't fit the world we live in. The point. And until we can find a way of, maybe my answer isn't the right answer, isn't good enough. But until we can find a way of sizing the answer to the real world we've got, we're either predetermined to fail um, or, or we just don't try and then threats get worse. Thanks. Okay. Um, I, I've saved uh, William Wentworth's question till last, but be, before I ask that, uh, I apologize to Wes and, and Mac, uh, who had great questions as well, but we are, we are running short on time. And this is a great question to close on. And I know you're going to, uh, to love this one as well. Um, he asked, Afghanistan is sometimes called the graveyard of empires. Do you think the war in Afghanistan signifies a decline in the American world order? And, and you wanted that answer how fast? <laughs> I, sa I saved it till last. So you got a half hour. No. <laughs> uh, sorry, I just couldn't resist. Yes or no? Yes or no? Um, <laughs> I'm a diplomat. We don't do yes. No, you know, we true. do maybe. Um, so, seriously. We live in a different world. We are not in the bipolar world where we were balanced against the Soviet Union. And we're not in this unipolar world that we got very used to, although it really only lasted about 10 or 15 years, where we were the you know uncontested big power. Um, I think we are still one of the biggest powers in the world unmatched militarily and with an enormously strong economy. But we now have new, we have new threats. You know, China is economically either a peer competitor or a near peer competitor. That was never true of the Soviet Union economically. So it's, it's a new situation. We are go. I think there's a great deal we can do in this world but a lot of it we're going to have to do with allies. This was one of my big beefs with the foreign policy of the Trump years, that it cast off allies that he didn't have the help you needed. Um, whatever one likes or dislikes about Mr. Trump's policies domestically, I think that we were, we considerably weakened ourselves internationally by an approach which was transactional, and built no alliances, weakened the alliances we had. Could I, I can come back, we can argue about that, preferably over a drink. Um, <laughs> but um, I think we can remain a major power in the world, maybe not exactly as big as we were 10 years ago, 15. And I also think that we are dealing with problems that threaten us, uh, drugs and crime and some economic issues and climate change 
which we can only deal with in a cooperative mode so that we may not be as big as we were but it is extraordinarily difficult to envision progress on most of those issues if we're not a major part of the progress so we may not be as big as we were overall but we are still incredibly important to the long-term future of the, of the world and in turn to our own prosperity and security and that's the best i could do for a short answer well and that, that is a really good good short answer well well done uh before i turn it over to angela to close us out i want to give you a a big thank you but i want to give a big shout out to your friend and a great friend of paywack john nixon uh, who introduced you to us here in Peoria, and we now consider you to be a good friend of ours. Uh, we will have you back, and I want to give a special thanks to John because I got a chance to know you, and when I go to D.C., I get to visit with you. So I, I appreciate the extra benefit out of it. So, uh, so John has, has been a, a real plus for us on that, and I know you John want to tell him hello as well. It, John and I have been friends so long that it is now a little embarrassing to reflect on just how long that is. <laughs> <laughs> here where I am doing that. Um, but again, we always appreciate you. Uh, and, uh, we, we look forward to you coming back in the future as well. So, uh, Angela, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ambassador Newman. This has given us a great deal to think about. Um, no magic crystal ball that you can tell us what's going to happen, but you've given us a great deal to ponder <laughs> over the next few months. On behalf of the Peoria Area World Affairs Council, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Next week, uh, remember there is no World Affairs uh, tomorrow. World Affairs Friday is tomorrow. Um, so have a wonderful weekend. But next week we have two exciting programs. On Thursday night, our Global Peoria International News Roundup will, um, we've invited John Nielsen back, professor of history here at Bradley. And he is going to talk about the current situation in Israel and Palestine. On Friday at 11 for our World Affairs Friday, we have uh, a, a group of women from the US State Department who will talk about our immigration policy and the challenges that we face at our border. So you won't wanna miss those. Everybody have a terrific weekend and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all on Thursday night. Angela, Don, John, thank thanks you. a lot, I enjoyed it. Thank you, Ambassador Newman. Thanks, thank you. John. Look forward to talking to you again. Good night. Good, Good, night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.